Um, without further ado, um, I just want to say that uh, Dr. Birnbaum is an internationally renowned toxicologist whose work on endocrine disruptors, pharmacokinetic behavior of environmental chemicals and linkages between environmental exposures and health effects has impacted practices and health outcomes globally. And today she's going to discuss with us the impacts of the global environmental health and what it means for our local families and communities. In her role as the director of the National Institute for Environmental Health and Sciences, which if you're not aware is right down the road from us here in RTP, uh, Dr. Birnbaum oversees federal funding for biomedical research to discover how the environmental influences, how the environment influences human health and disease. A board certified toxicologist, she served as a federal scientist for over 37 years and she's the first toxicologist and the first woman to lead NIEHS and the National Toxicology Program. Dr. Birnbaum is a former president of the Society of Toxicology, which is the largest professional organization of toxicologists in the world, and a former vice president of the International Union of Toxicology, which is the umbrella organization for toxicology societies in more than 50 countries. She's the author of more than 800 peer-reviewed publications, so you folks that are on the fellows track, you better get going, uh, book chapters and reports, and is adjunct professor at several universities, including Duke University and the University of North Carolina. She's also received many prestigious awards for her research, and I think when we first met, she had just um, received the North Carolina Award, which is the highest civilian honor given by the state of North Carolina. Uh, in, in 2016, that was, uh, she had received that. Uh, she's a native of New Jersey, and she received her MS and PhDs in microbiology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she's married and has three children. So Linda, I'll turn the podium over to you, and thank you again for being here. So thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure for me to have an opportunity to talk kind of in the hometown area um, instead of having to get on a plane and go somewhere else in the country. But over the years, um, I've actually been in North Carolina now for over 37 years. They have, we've had many interactions, or I've personally had many interactions with people here at RTI. So it's really great to be here. Now what I want to do today is talk a little about kind of some major global public health issues and which are actually also happening locally as well. And I thought that that would be interesting. But I first want to know, who hasn't been to NIEHS? Yeah, lots of you. OK. We are a very well-kept secret, I think, in the Triangle area. We are the only institute of the National Institutes of Health which is not headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. And that's because we were a payback from Jack Kennedy to Terry Sanford after, <laughs> after delivering North Carolina to the Democratic column. And so that was a time when politics actually worked. And um, it, so obviously not being there has both you know, challenges and opportunities. But basically, we love the fact that we are here. Um, we, like any NIH institute, we have vibrant intramural laboratories and research programs. We have, in fact, about 1,400 people. And I should say kind of just down T.W. Alexander Drive. Um, I mean, it's actually a little embarrassing. Our campus is larger than the Bethesda campus, the rest of NIH. Certainly my office is much more beautiful than Dr. Collins's. But <laughs> so we also have a clinical research program, which was I was the first one to actually establish that. And we have a small clinic on site where we actually are recruiting patients for asthma studies and for adolescent studies, as well as we do a lot of stuff in the clinic. Um, we have a vibrant extramural funding program. And I know there are certain people here in this building who are recipients of our extramural grants. Um, and I'm very happy to say that since we didn't get cut in FY17, you'll be seeing more of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Now, in addition, the National Toxicology Program is headquartered here at NIEHS. And this is a cross-agency effort that involves FDA and CDC, as well as NIH. So, but it is a problem-solving group. Unlike NIH's basic mission, which is basic biomedical research, the NTP's mission is to solve problems, develop new tests, conduct tests, evaluate hazardous substances, and so on. Um, 
What also makes us different than much of NIH is our focus is not on treatment and cures. It is really on prevention of disease because you can't change your genes, you can change your environment. So we have an opportunity here to make a difference. And we really do have a public health focus as well. So we did our, a couple of years after I came on board as director, it's hard to believe it's eight and a half years ago now, but we did a new strategic plan. And as you can see there, these are our themes. And if you look at the one at the bottom, that's our global environmental health theme. And it's overlaid, we have, so we have six themes and then two overlapping. And I used to have, in the center of this, those arrows used to move, but someone who was subject to epileptic seizures said that was not such a good thing to do, so we made it stationary. But anyhow, we, you can't do any of our work without large data management approaches and inter interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary efforts. And our mission is to understand what it is in the environment, how it impacts our health so that we can promote healthier lives, and our vision is that we will be providing global leadership to prevent disease and disability from environmental exposures. So I should have mentioned, we are about to start another strategic plan. It's been five years since we did this first one. It's time to relook at it again. So we would appreciate anyone who has any ideas, visions, let us know about them. We'll be putting out a call on the internet soon. But so why are we concerned with the environmental burden of disease? Well, the first thing I want to mention is that we're real concerned with non-communicable diseases. This is not to downplay malaria. This is not to downplay TB. This is not to downplay HIV or Zika or anything else. But the great majority of disease and death are caused by non-communicable diseases, things like cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity. And we need to be addressing them. And in fact, the World Health Organization just a year ago reviewed the situation and said that nearly a quarter of all global deaths are linked to the environment. And that the environmental risk factors, which include air and water and soil pollution, contribute to over, I think the actual number they give is 103 different diseases and injury, and injury types. And most of these, as I've already said, are related to non-communicable diseases and the majority as many as 7 million deaths a year are attributable to air pollution. Now, we'll talk about air pollution a little bit later because you may think our air here is great and it's certainly a lot better than it used to be and it doesn't look like Beijing or Delhi. But in fact, even with the quality air we have, health effects are incurring in at least some susceptible members of the population. And that who are most at risk from environmental problems? It's children and the elderly and other susceptible populations. So what do I mean when I say environment? And there are a whole number of things. It's not just chemicals that are present in our water and our air and our soil. soil. It's things like prescription drugs. What are drugs? Drugs are chemicals. What about food? What is food made of? Chemicals. All these things can interact to impact our health. And also things like, for example, cosmetics, infectious agents. We know that exposure to certain kinds of, for example, viruses of bacteria, you may have a differential response depending what else you're exposed to, or maybe what else, for example, was in your diet. We know that synthetic materials, we know that our lifestyle, I mean, everybody's aware of the fact smoking is a lifestyle factor and obviously has a tremendous impact on health, and a wide range of chemicals and pesticides and so on. All of these things, so when I speak about environment, there are many times when I'm speaking about this biggie, not a specific chemical or something. So should we be concerned about our environment? And these are just a couple of graphs, and I've got lots more <laughs> in my folders that I could show you. But the one, for example, on your upper left, that's the increase in thyroid cancer, which has been increasing at a rate since about 1970 or 80 of over 3% a year. Okay? If you look, for example, at the increase in autism prevalence, um, between 2010 and 2012, now one in 68 children are diagnosed being somewhere on the autism spectrum. Some of it's differential diagnosis, but not all of it. If you look, for example, at the increase in Alzheimer's disease, this has a huge cost impact on our population, a huge lifestyle impact. That keeps going up. And, for example, the increase in cancer um, prevalence in adults has also continued to increase. The mortality for many kinds of cancer, especially in this country, has decreased because we're better at treating. But the 
the occurrence is continuing to increase. So these changes are happening within one or two generations, sometimes within 10 or 12 years. This is too rapid for it to be due just to our genes. Here's another example I just thought I'd show you on obesity. I think we're all aware of what I would call an obesity epidemic in this country. If you look on the left part of the slides, what you can see is the time pattern where the colors are indicating the percent obesity in the population. And what you can see, for example, well, if you go back to 1985, the map is pretty light. It's mainly white, a little bit of blue, of course, the south which we know we have the, the obesity belt down here in the south. But as time goes on, you start seeing orange and red show up. And right now, or at least it's 2010, what you can see is that much of the south and the Midwest has very high incidence of obesity. Um, Colorado, which had been the one blue state for many, many, many years, has finally now converted to a yellow, which is even, even Coloradans are starting to put on weight while they're busy hiking in the Rockies. Um, and then if you look at children, and that's, this is um, a graph showing just some data from looking at children ar around the world and the amount of obesity, we're number five in the world with the amount of obesity in children. But again, the increase in obesity in children is happening just like adults as well. And many um, less developed countries, like the number one up there is Ethiopia, has the highest increase because, in fact, what's the cheapest food? It's the least healthy food. So I've already mentioned that non-communicable diseases are clearly um, increasing, are important in the population and increases. And if you look at this, if you look at you, the graph on your left, what you can see here is that while communicable, communicable diseases are actually decreasing, as the percent of mortality, the non-communicable diseases are increased. And then if you look at the slide on your right, what this shows is that even poor countries, the low-income countries over time, are having more and more of their disease and mortality due to um, chronic non-communicable diseases. Um, and in, in this list, I've included, for example, asthma and autism. So and if we look at the environmental burden of disease, where is the burden the worst? Well, it's in the countries that can often least afford to deal with it. So if you look, for example, I don't know if this is showing up very well. But if you look on the top there, this is the disability adjusted life years, which is a measure of, and, and is a way of comparing the uh, quality of life, basically, in different countries. And what do you see is India and Bangladesh are up there um, with the most disability um, adjusted years, and the U.S. is down in your, lower, in your lower right with the least, and then kind of spread across. So even some of our BRIC countries like Brazil or Russia um, are also have quite a pred environmental problems and impact on their um, quality of life. So why are, is NIEHS so interested in this? Well, as I said before, our focus is on prevention, and we're focused on understanding the interaction between our genetic susceptibilities, our environmental exposures. And I'm going to say now, and I'll probably say it again, and if not, somebody can remind me, it's never just your genes, and it's never just your environment. It's always an interaction between the two. Even with, even with um, health conditions which are largely determined genetic, think of something like PKU. Well, as long as the child doesn't have a lot of tryptophan or, phenyl or phenylalanine in their diet, they'll grow up with normal intellectual function, okay? So in that case, it's a nutrient, which is the environmental trigger. So always genes and your environment. So NIEHS has provided leadership, along with the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH, in a program that was called the, Gene Initi the Genes, Environment, and Health Initiative, where we led the exposure biology program and tied it in with the people who were doing a lot of the genomics. And we were looking at issues, and really our focus here was developing new tools and new approaches and new ways to measure different environmental stressors, whether it was diet, developed a great. And when I say we, it's a royal we. I haven't done any of this, <laughs> but our grantees have. But, you know, we developed a really nice-looking pendant, which was actually a little camera, so they could actually take a picture. Because try to remember what you ate two days ago. It's hard, and it's often inaccurate. 
Measure physical activity. Well, lots of us are walking around with activity monitors on today, but the part of that comes out of some of these efforts. Psychosocial stress and addiction and all kinds of measuring air pollution um, where people could wear personal sensors and so on. So we're very interested in the fact that every single one of us carries a significant burden of man-made kind of chemicals. So we know that, so I'll come back and use some of these are some of our favorites, BPA in almost all of us, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that's what you inhale when you're standing by a busy roadway and the diesel truck goes by. You also get it from barbecuing your, your lovely steak. Um, phthalates are in your personal care products and some of your plastics. Perfluorinated compounds, I'm going to come back to them later. I mean, PFCs are right now a big deal in the news. You've probably all heard of the Teflon chemical, the PFOA. The PFAS that we all have in we all have it in our body. PVDEs, those are fl flame retardants. Come back to them later. Triclosan, FDA, yes, finally said doesn't do any good to have it in soaps. Take it out, and that's been a huge um, advantage. And PCBs were banned in the United States in 1977, and every single one of us in this room still has them in our body. And that's because they have very long half-lives, not only in us, but in the environment. And they're going to be around probably for over 100 years before we see actually levels where we can't measure them. We know that if we look at, in another study, if we look at pregnant women, can detect at least 47 chemicals or more. We find that in breast milk. So if mom has it, it's going to get to her baby. And in fact, when they looked at cord blood, they could measure at least 287 different chemicals. Now, one of the points I want to get across here is that we're never exposed to one compound in isolation or one chemical or one dietary nutrient. It's always a mixture. And we need to begin to understand what that means when they're all together. And there are some people here at RTI who are busy looking at some of this and are actually beginning to look at this new way of looking at exposure, which is the exposome. And the exposome is often described as the totality of human exposure. When we monitor, and I tell you there were 287 compounds present in cord blood of an infant, that's looking under the lamppost. That's what we know might be there. What about all the things we don't know about? And so the exposome, which is an agnostic, an untargeted way of looking at the totality of exposure, it's kind of like deep sequencing of the genome and um, the GWAS screening, where you're looking at everything. You don't know what it means, but you're going to go ahead and measure it. And again, we're looking at mixtures, both chemical and non-chemical. And I didn't mention the microbiome, but believe me, we've got loads of bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc., in and on us. And they are extremely important to our health as well as our disease. And I think you all know, taking antibiotics, yes, it may save your life, but it may totally mess up your gut microbiota. It may take a while to reestablish it. So that there are things that we have to also consider about the interactions between our, the microbiome and whatever exposures we have. In addition, there are different times in our life when we are more susceptible or not. So why is development such a sensitive time for exposure? It's kind of obvious because that's when your body is rapidly growing and changing. So I'm talking about, like, say, in utero development here, but it's not only in utero. Think about the fact what happens during puberty. Everybody knows that teenagers aren't very stable. Same kind of thing. Lots of growth, lots of cell differentiation, lots of changes in metabolism. Whenever things are changing, that's when you're going to be most susceptible. And we know that development is an extremely integrated process. So if you prevent, for example, in the formation of the top of the roof of your mouth, there are these two palatal shells and they have to come together. Well, if you prevent them from coming together at the right time, the head is going to continue to grow and they'll never come together. So the importance of timing is very important. So some of the windows in utero, infancy, childhood, adolescence, pregnancy, Pregnancy, not only for the growing fetus, but for the mom, because her body's changing, and old age. And what I don't have on here is the fact that dads matter. Almost so much of the focus has been on in utero exposure. We're now beginning to understand that prior to conception is also a sensitive time, and that we need to be thinking both of men and women 
prior to conception because the formation of the sperm, the formation and the development of the eggs can be modified by environmental exposures. So what we've learned is that what happens early in life can have long-term effects. And this is a very simplistic picture because I'm actually start preconception and showing how it might infect, for example, childhood or adolescence or even old age. But we also know that things that happen prenatally or in childhood or in puberty or in reproductive can have impacts later on. So this whole issue is, is there's a whole new field which is called the development origins of health and disease. And a lot of this was driven and things that we learned from the Holocaust and from the Dutch winter famine and from what happened in Britain at the, towards the end of World War II. And those people have been followed, I mean, the significant cohorts have been followed now for 60, 70 years. And we find that people who under, underwent a nutritional deprivation, not starvation, but deprivation, for example, in utero or early life, 40, 50, 60, 70 years later, have increased risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And that is proof that this can happen, and now we're beginning to find chemicals um, exposures that have done the same kind of thing. So when we talk about global environmental health at NIEHS, we know that what happens in China, or air emissions in China, reach California in four days. Air emissions in Africa come east in actually fewer days. We have a small world. There's no such thing as boundaries to environmental, for example, stressors. So again, as I said in our strategic plan, we identify global environmental health as a key issue. And we, some, we're trying to our global environmental health, health program look at some of the most pressing global um, issues, especially in low and middle income countries. Why? Because it's easier to study if you have really bad exposures than um, say at the kind of background levels we had. Now, if you're interested in our global environmental program, I'd like to mention that we have a global environmental health newsletter, which is issued by or issued quarterly, which talks about a lot of things that are going on, has a lot of interesting articles and so on. We have podcasts that you can either get on iTunes or from our website and, or from the global environmental health chat. Um, we have. If, if you haven't looked at the NIEHS website, I would urge you to do it. It has a great kids page as well with all kinds of songs and games and environmental things that kids can do. Um, we have webinars, which can be, um, they're usually announced in the global health newsletter or, or otherwise. And we have a lot of meetings that we convene and participate on the global scene. And we run lots of um, programs in many parts of the world. And this is just a subset. So in your upper left, that's a study being done out of John Hopkins that have been looking at aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a mold on corn. And it's a major problem in parts of a developing world. But what's interesting is that it causes liver cancer. But if you just have aflatoxin, the incidence is pretty low. But if you also have a specific virus, the EB virus, then you get about a 40-fold increase in the susceptibility to liver cancer from aflatoxin. So again, a kind of a gene or actually a infectious disease environment interaction. The one in the, um, in the middle is a, um, a study being done out of Duke, where the young lady in, in the middle is the Duke, the Duke um, Dukey, the Duke student actually, a graduate student, who has been distributing inexpensive cameras to women in Nepal so that they can actually record what it is that they do in their life, a little bit like I talked about the camera to record your diet. The one in the upper right is a study that we're doing looking at colds in um, Argentina, and this is actually being done by one of our intramural scientists, but RSV is basically the cold virus. We all get it all the time. Some kids get really, really sick. And most don't. Well, why? Trying to understand the gene environment interaction there. On the bottom left is gold mining. Now, this is in Suriname in South America, but this also occurs in Brazil. It occurs in many parts of Africa. The way that you get gold out of, for example, some of the rocks is you use mercury. Well, we're going to talk more about mercury, but mercury, as we know, is a really bad neurotoxicant. It affects the brain really seriously. So the mercury is there, it's, it gets into the water supply, it gets methylated by bacteria, it gets picked up by the fish. What do the, these people eat? They're eating fish. 
and so we're having problems. But that's that's an interesting study that we're doing there through through something called the GeoHub program, which is really focusing on training and capacity building in the developing world. And then the picture on your lower right is e-waste in China, and that just shows the little kids sitting in the middle of where all this recycling is going on. And I can tell you, this is not just China. This is India. This is Nepal. This is Vietnam. This is many parts of Africa, many parts of Latin America, um, Central America as well. There's not, not, nothing like industrial hygiene practices. And in many cases, again, kids and women are being heavily exposed to a lot of the chemicals, um, heavy metals and organic chemicals that are present um, in e-waste. So this is just an example showing you we've got at least 106 projects around the world that NIEHS is doing. Um, the colors give you an indication. Uh, it's interesting that the Bangladesh is the, the red spot. We have a lot of studies there, and I'm going to show you a picture or two related to um, arsenic, which is a huge problem in Bangladesh and in several other places in the world, including, I will tell you, in North Carolina. But this does not include our intramural studies. Um, th there are those as well, but this is from our grants program um, around the world. So I mentioned um, the e-waste as part of our WHO Collaborating Center. We are the first NIH Institute, which I think is amazing, to actually have a collaborating center with the World Health Organization. CDC has lots of them. But we established this um, three and a half years ago, and it's working very well. It has a number of different focus areas. Um, climate change is one of them. And I'll talk a little about that, although I'm not supposed to talk about climate change. <laughs> so I may, I may refer to it as extreme weather events instead. Um, you know, there's a, we've had a long-term uh, long engagement with WHO related to children's health. I've mentioned e-waste. I'm going to come back and talk about the household air pollution and some of the work and the important things about cook stoves. We, have, we um, foster a chemical risk assessment network that has over 49 countries participating. And DOHAD, that's Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, which is so what happens early in life can set the trajectory for the rest of your life. So I said I was going to talk about indoor air a minute. Um, we know that at least over 4 million people, of those 7 million who die from air pollution each year, over 4 million are dying from indoor air pollution. Now, why don't people know that? Well, the reason is, is nobody regulates indoor air pollution. Nobody's coming into your house and saying, oh my goodness, the level of particulates or the level of volatiles is too high in your house. But we can regulate it outdoors. So ambient air is regulated. Now, some of the ambient air comes in, and some of that's the source. But in many parts of the world, including parts of America, parts of America. Residential, residential wood smoke wood interventions smoke. we're trying to look at both in the Nez Perce and the Navajo, and the Navajo um, population. population in our Native Americans. There are 16 million people in the U.S. who heat and cook with wood stoves. And I will tell you that there is no way if you're burning biomass that you can get the level of air, air pollution down to a level that you won't have health effects. So we've got a number of projects. We're looking at using kerosene. Well, that's a bio product. Maybe better than burning coal in your house. But look at the risk of tuberculosis. Um, there are clear effects of impacts on neurodevelopment from biomass wood, wood smoke. We've got studies that we're doing with um, National Institute of Heart, Lung, and Blood, the National Institute, National Cancer Institute, National Child Health Institute, the Fogarty Center, and the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we are doing an interventional trial where we're actually replacing the traditional cook stoves with either a gas or an electric cook stoves, because those are the only ones which are going to get your level of air pollution down to a safe level. Now, trying to replace traditional cook stoves is not so easy. If any of you are behavioral scientists, you'll know that there are huge cultural issues that have to be um, dealt with here as well. But we've got this going on now in four different countries trying to see what we can do there. But on, on your left, I'm telling you about what people are di dying from, from, it, from indoor air pollution. Pneumonia, that's in kids, stroke, heart disease, COPD. I used to think COPD was only from smoking. Well, in indoor air pollution, you can get COPD because the levels of pollutants 
Um, this actually looks pretty good because it, it, you can see the woman. I could have shown you some pictures here, especially from Guatemala, where I have, um, where we've had long-standing grantees there working. You can barely see the people who are cooking over their stoves. And what are women and infants on their backs doing? They're spending most of the time cooking inside this heavily polluted area. So I mentioned so ambient I mentioned air quality, air quality, and we know actually a lot more about that, although again, I could say, what would we think that if the, air, the, uh, the levels of air pollution are so much worse indoors, we're not going to see the same thing we've seen in heavily polluted outdoor areas. It's kind of we're just beginning to make that understanding. But we've looked at lots of work that have shown the causal relationship between air pollution and cardiovascular disease as well as respiratory effects. Um, we funded the Harvard Six City Studies, which started in 1974. I should say it's still being followed to this day. It's expanded from six cities to eight cities to 12 cities to 24 cities to 51 cities. But they're longitudinal studies where we're looking at the levels of air pollution and a variety of different health effects. So we know, we used to think that air pollution just impacted your, your lungs. But now we know that it has tremendous impacts on your heart and on your whole and vascular your whole system vascular as well. well. And, and and that's just a kind of a picture showing, I think, a diesel truck and the level of air pollution that air pollution comes out of it. Um, this is a really important understanding, I think, and we've had it for about 10 years, but even more information now. Living near busy roadways is not good for your health. It's not good for your children's health. It's not good for the fetus's health and has long-term impact. So California, you know, we used to say, as, what is this, New York goes, so goes the nation. We now say it's California because, frankly, they're the ones who are making reasonable regulatory decisions. But they don't allow schools to be cited within, um, I think it's 500, 500, not 500 meters, 500 feet of a busy roadway. How many times do you see a new school going up right next to a busy highway? This is a huge problem. Sure. Okay. Um, so what we're finding is that early life exposure, as well as adult exposure, impacts not only your lungs, and it's associated with asthma, it also impacts IQ. And I will tell you some of the strongest environmental evidence we have for, for autism is near roadway exposure to the mother. So I think that this is very concerning. Well, some really good studies have come out from Southern our grantees at USC and UCLA where they've been following cohorts and children. First recruited some in 91 and 92, some in 2001 and 2, 2009 and 10. Well, that's the time that air pollution has been coming down in LA. Still not as clean as you'd like the air, but it's much better. And what they're showing is that children, the most recent cohort of children at age seven have much better lung fu function than kids who were born or were in, involved in the cohort in the early 90s or the early 2000s. So a direct correlation that, you know, lower exposure, better lung function in kids. So I mentioned the IQ deficits. We, there are a number of studies that are showing decreased cognitive function and developmental decline in those exposed to air pollution. There was a, just a whole article in the New York Times Magazine about two months ago about an association between air pollution and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that would be in adults, but we also know that in utero and early life exposure can impact um, not only IQ, but also ADHD and, as I said, risk of autism. And that we know that air pollution can cause inflammation of the brain, and that may be part of it. And this is getting into the weeds, but microglia, which are the major immune cells of the brain, um, may be playing a role in this, and we're currently looking at that. So I um, don't have time to talk about all the things that air pollution can do, but this kind of is just a word cloud that gives you some idea. And those are some of the lovely pictures of how things used to look in America. But you know, every year here we get some red alert days, and I'm always laughing when they say it's a red alert day, you know, tr you know. Use your bikes, you know, don't <laughs> drive. Well, that's, we know that that's not good for your health as well. But we even know that at the current regulatory limits, both for both for ozone, for, exa for example, and for particulate matter, that susceptible individuals, and by susceptible, I mean 
because they're very young, because they're very old, maybe because they already have asthma, someone with asthma are still having impacts below the current regulatory limits. And every time we have an exceedance of the regulatory limits, I can tell you that the number of people going to the hospital because of, say, a major asthma attack goes up. And then when the air gets better, the, it goes down. So I'm going to switch to another pollutant for a moment and talk about arsenic. Now I think everybody knows this very classic play. Everyone remembers Teddy charging up the stairs, you know, thinking that he's Teddy Roosevelt and he's climbing San Juan Hill. And remember his two sisters who were um, out of charity um, taking care of these gentlemen callers. Um, um, and burying them in the basement, them in they the were basement. exposing they were them, exposed. giving them arsenic, giving them arsenic. Um, and um, which can be lethal at high doses. Doses. Well, doses. Well, we're not normally we're not concerned normally with that, that, although those of you who've lived in North, North, North Carolina, Carolina or this area for any, any amount of time remember that we've had two had terrible, terrible um, um, murders, murders committed in this area, area. Two murders actually, but two terrible two incidents, terrible. one Blanche Moore from Burlington, who was able to successfully kill uh, three husbands, I think, and almost kill several others before she was caught. And um, I mean, especially the last one was a physician who, not a physician, he was a, her, her minister who she married in a week after the marriage. She poisoned him with lots of arsenic in um, his food. Uh, he survived, um, anyhow, and that's how they actually finally caught her. And then the terrible story of Eric Miller in uh, the late 90s, who was a uh, pediatric resident at um, UNC, and um, his wife and her her boyfriend um, poisoned him, and it took several years to find out what had happened. The boyfriend ended up killing himself a month after the husband had been killed. Um, she's now in jail for, I think, 25 or 30 years. Um, anyhow, but that's not what we're talking about with environmental. <laughs> So I mentioned Bangladesh, and we're doing lots of studies there. Well, this is a picture of a woman getting water um, from a tube well. Now, there were such problems in, in many parts of the world with surface water being contaminated by microorganisms, that people would develop lots of GI diseases and stuff. So WHO went in trying to do the right thing. And they went in and they sunk about 25 meters down tube wells to get to the groundwater underneath. Well, they never thought about testing the groundwater. It came out, it was clean, there were no microorganisms in it, it tasted good, it was clear. But within 10 years, you had people developing frank arsenic po poisoning, which is, this is an example of what's called Blackfoot disease, which is a, a um, skin condition with a lot of lesions and very uncomfortable. This is a very high level of exposure. But what they found, began to find, and what our grantees have been studying for years are all the variety of health effects that we're seeing from arsenic. We've known for 60 years that arsenic is associated with multiple kinds of cancer, and we've known that from um, occupational studies where people involved in mining were inhaling arsenic that was, for example, on the dust and were developing lung cancer, but we now know it's clearly associated with other kinds. We know that it does affect the lungs, so you can have, for example, CO, um, COPD and other lung disorders. Arsenic has impacts on your cardiovascular system. It causes reproductive and developmental problems. It another Another exposure that has impacts on the developing in, um, fetus and infant as far as IQ impacts. It impacts the immune system. It seems to suppress your ability to mount an immune response. It's associated with an increase in type 2 diabetes. And it disrupts lots of endocrine systems. And I'm not going to talk about endocrine dis disruption today, but I'm happy to answer any questions. But the point is, the lower and lower and lower we go with arsenic, we have not found a level where we don't see anything. Okay. 
So that was a, just that was a, an example from, from Bangladesh. From the effects Bangladesh. are from everywhere, but, from everywhere. but the Bangladeshi. The Bangladesh. This is a study in Chile, which is kind of another example of a good intention gone bad, which is this is an Anafagasta, which is at the northern end of Chile, right in that super dry desert region um, in northern Chile. And what they did is there was a, you know, a lot of copper is a big mining issue in Chile, and a copper mine 50 miles upstream had diverted the water of a river to wash out the copper slag from the mine. And the, the town is 50 miles downstream. Well, between 1958 and 1970, the levels of arsenic that were now in the drinking water were extremely, extremely high, and tens of thousands were exposed, um, including in utero and his children. And so this kind of give us what I, what I hate. To, you know, sometimes scientists, they'll say, oh, I found this great result. And they're talking about something really terrible, like people getting cancer or children being born with birth defects. But this gives us, we could actually isolate when were people exposed. Were they exposed in utero only? Were they exposed in utero? and throughout, say, childhood? Or did they just start getting exposed as an adult? Because you have, we know when the exposure occurred. And so the population of this town has been All guests involved, have been muted. We're, this you is can unmute your we're line really by seeing pressing some great star data six. related to the developmental effects of arsenic. Um, again, great data, but a really sad situation. But it's important for us to know. And now if we come to North Carolina, the star is uh, kind of right where we are in RTP. And those dark counties were not as dark as, say, Sampson County down at the at the at the bottom. Um, no, Stanley County is the one with 273. But um, some of our grantees at UNC did a study a couple of years ago where they basically um, measured people's individual wells. So 2.3 million people in North Carolina get their drinking water not from a municipal water supply, but from a well. And we found that about 14% of those wells have arsenic in them. And about um, overall levels that exceeded EPA's regulatory limit, which happens to be 10 parts per billion in the drinking water, um, about 2% of the wells exceeded that regulatory limit. Now, all the wells weren't tested, but about 63,000 across the state were. So all I'm going to suggest is that if you, if you use well water, in your house for drinking, please have your water tested because there are filters, commercial filters you can buy, which can remove the arsenic from the drinking water. Because we know that no level of arsenic is actually safe, but that's where we are in North Carolina. Um, so if you're in Orange County, Chatham County, you might think about it. So um, there was another study that was really th that the same group from UNC looked at, uh, led by Rebecca Fry, who's a uh, young associate professor there. She looked at the counties where metals were high. And so sometimes it's not only arsenic. Sometimes you could have other metals like cadmium and manganese and lead. And found that um, this was what's called an ecological study. So it didn't really measure the levels in each person or each person's well but it looked on a county-wide or a census tract kind of um, wide database. What they found is that those people who had the highest metals exposure, there was a higher risk of having birth defects. And this is by looking at the birth defects registry from North Carolina compared to people who had the lowest level exposure. And they actually found that manganese itself was explicitly connected to a specific kind of cardiac defect. Now, we know that manganese at, um, at high levels causes neurological effects. But we're also finding that at low levels, for example, early life exposure, this is a suggestion of a cardiac effect. We do know that it's associated with neurological effects as well. So to change to another environmental stressor, um, extreme weather events. Um, so this is just showing you two pictures um, 20 years apart about the Arctic sea ice. We've lost an area that's equivalent to one third of the land mass of the United States has been lost. That is a huge amount. I think you, you know, we read all the time about, oh, there's a huge, another part of the ice sheet in Greenland, which is now cracked off. There's some melting of glaciers. Anybody who's been to Glacier National Park, if you were there 25, 30 years ago, it doesn't look like that anymore. And in fact, there are almost no glaciers left at all. 
so that anyone who thinks that there isn't changes in the climate um, has has an issue. So um, we. <laughs> so um, some of again the people in our country who are most impacted are are people who are already at some kind of disadvantage. And um, I actually did a site visit. My husband went with me to. Um, Visit St. Lawrence Island, which you've, I'm sure you've never heard of it, but it is a island about the size of Puerto Rico, um, right near the International Date Line in the Bering Sea, about um, 180 miles southeast of Nome. Um, during World War, well, during and after World War II and the Cold War, it was a major listening site where the Air Force had bases there to listen to the Russians because. Guess what? It's only 25 miles from Siberia, and Sarah Palin's husband was stationed there at one point, and that's maybe he could see Siberia <laughs> on a clear day. <laughs> but anyhow, um, but but you, there are about the Yupik are the, the, the Yupik nation um, are Inuit peoples. Uh, they live they've lived here as far as they know. Their whole lifestyle has been impacted. They the walruses. There isn't enough sea ice for the walrus to get close enough for them to go out in the early spring um, in their what used to be sealskin boats. Now they use 14-foot um, aluminum boats, to open boats, to go out and hunt seals. So they're not, they used to be called the, the, um, the wal I meant the walrus people, um, but now they're having to depend on whale, getting bowfin whales and seals and stuff. But there's been a huge problem on their island because of contamination that was left by the Air Force and because and this is just some pictures of, of visiting and some, some of the people that we met with there, because there's something that many chemicals, many compounds, um, both volatile chemicals and things that are less volatile, things like DDT, things like PCBs, things like the flame retards and dioxins, they basically, you can get some of it going up to the atmosphere at temperatures like where we live, but then it goes up, you know, the, the winds swirl them around the atmosphere and you end up in the Arctic, and what happens in the Arctic? It gets cold, so then they precipitate out. So that our far north peoples around the globe are the most highly contaminated peoples in the world because of this process of global distillation. And then what do they eat? These people are subsistence hunters and fishers. In other words, in the summer, they're a little bit, and I do say little bit of herbs or grasses that grow on this very barren area. but. Most of the time, they're eating seals and walrus and whale and some fish. And these are top predators, top carnivores, and you are what you eat. And these many of the compounds bioaccumulate up the marine food chain. So if you're eating them, you're getting a high dose. And so these are the most contaminated people in the world. And in fact, our grantees have shown that their PCB levels are three to nine times that of the average American in the lower 48 today. So the, here's North Carolina. Well, that's the Outer Banks and people, were, this happens to be Hurricane Irene in 2008 and you can see that it's Route 12 coming down that you can see there and you can see it being cut and it was cut again I think two years ago. You know, these are meant to be barrier islands, which means they're supposed to move. Um, but some of this, they're happening more and more frequently. And also what's happening with our farmers. So we know that we have many Latino, largely Latino farmers, uh, farm workers. And in North Carolina, not the soybeans or not, you know, or the or cotton, but all the fruits and berries are all still picked by hand. They're not automated. And we're finding that 85% um, of the crops are picked that way. And that we're finding an increased risk of heat related illnesses in our farm workers. And we're starting, you know, as I said, we are seeing an increase and we're starting to see it rise. And that's because we have longer, hotter times. So I think the last chemical or kind of exposure I'm really going to talk about is mercury. And I already mentioned mercury and the fact that where is mercury coming from? Well, I should tell you, I mean, yesterday on the news, I heard about the Aurora mine in Beaufort, North Carolina. I'm actually going to show you where that is. I have a map. But that is the largest phosphate mine in the world. And Representative Walter Jones wants to be released from EPA's regulation on the level of mercury that they can emit. So you know, t many of us tend to think of mercury in North Carolina coming from coal-fired power plants 
or coal ash, but it's also coming from phosphate mines. Okay. So anyway, you have this natural cycle where you have both natural and man-made emissions that are, and it circulates in the atmosphere and gets into the water. And again, you've got this bioaccumulation. It's converted from inorganic mercury to methylmercury. So what are the effects? Well, you've all heard about the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. That was believed to be due to inorganic mercury, which is, for example, tremors, slowed motor nerve function, again, effects on the brain especially, but also effects on the immune system and in the kidney. But methylmercury is the one that I think that people have the most concern for. That's the, that's the kind of mercury that accumulates in fish. That's why when you go to the store, you'll see don't buy or only have one meal of swordfish a year or don't eat tilefish, or don't eat certain kinds of, I think it's Spanish mackerel, because the mercury levels are too high. And because once you get it into your body, it has a very long half-life. The methylmercury, you know, will be with you for about a year, um, what you eat. And so we know, and there have been some horrific poisoning incidents that have happened from the methylmercury. There is a disease in Japan called Itai Itai, which was because there was a big factory um, which dumped its waste into a enclosed bay in southern Japan. People were fishermen, ate the fish, and then you had these terrible neurological um, sequelae. But anyhow, on your bottom left is just a graph. The red is showing you the higher the methylmercury, the, the more problems are, or, and the lower IQ effects. So we've got lots of global mercury issues. I've already mentioned the Suriname with the uh, mining. The Faroe Islands, again, that's an example. Faroe Islands are small islands, about 50,000 people, between Scotland and Iceland. They're owned by Denmark. Um, but again, the children born to mothers who had higher methylmercury have lower IQs. They also have impaired immune systems. I should tell you that, too. Um, there was an example in Iraq, and I, there's the picture, actually, some of the Minamata Bay. That's a child with Itai Itai showing the uh, physical changes as well as the neurological changes. And locally, well, I've got, I've got the highlight, the star by RTP, but that dark area on the coast, that's Beaufort County, and the Aurora Mine is 30, 31 or 41 miles, kind of in the northwestern part of that county. It's right on a river, and the phosphate um, product is transported by the water to Moorhead City, where it's then put on trains or boats to be distributed worldwide. But we're busy have investigators who are looking at, for example, the impacts of fly ash on children who are living near the landfills and the coal ash ponds. You meant the Dan River spill that occurred in 2013 was the third largest coal ash spill that's ever occurred. Haven't had time to talk about all these other goodies. Um, I did mention the phthalates, the BP, uh, pesticides, PFOS, P PFO is the Teflon chemical. I mean, these are all stain repellents, for example, that have been used. Uh, I haven't mentioned lead. Everybody's aware of lead because of Flint, Michigan. But guess what? If you've got old pipes, or you have you live in a house with old paint, you might want to have your you might want to have your kids tested for lead. Um, flame retardants, and there are many different alternatives. And I put that there specifically because we have a habit of going from one bad chemical to another one, which we know nothing about, but then turns out to be worse. So that's what's happening with the replacements for PFAS and PFOA right now. So how do we get our word out in a global environment? Well, we, have, we are the only NIH institute which has its own journal, which is Environmental Health Perspectives. It has a very high impact factor and highly regarded. But it is actually translated into Chinese, into Spanish, and into um, an African, and in, in, it's also published in Mali as well, um, so that it can be, is distributed worldwide. And it's totally um, available on the web as well, and there's no subscription fee or anything. So our global environmental health focus is we conduct research looking at health effects and exposure, we look especially focusing on uh, disadvantaged populations, whether they're in this country or abroad. We translate those research findings into information that can be used by decision makers, hopefully. 
um, and that we we really have a focus on training capacity building as well, so that we are interested. We have over 100 international postdoctoral fellows who are working down the road from here right now. We kind of try to run um, that all the time, but we also provide training in other countries, and we partner with institutions in other countries to improve the scientific base of knowledge. So preparation and partnerships are the keys to prevention within communities. Um, environmental factors are much more readily changed than genetic factors and tremendous opportunity. And as I said before, we can't change our genes, but we can change our environment. So thank you all. We have time for a few questions, and um, I'll let you moderate yourself. You're okay. very experienced. Um, <laughs> and uh, But I did want to remind everyone that we will have a reception after work. So well, thank uh, you. we'll let Linda take a few questions. So you can see I get pretty excited about what I talk about. <laughs> a lot of information about animal agriculture here in North Carolina. And um, we now know that animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of um, environmental issues, including overfishing, destruction of wildlife, deforestation, depletion of freshwater resources, antibiotic resistance. Um, you know, what are what are groups, environmental groups, doing to address this issue? Well, I, if you're asking about what kind of research is being done or who's doing it, different. I mean, there are different um, groups that would be dealing with this. So USDA has some efforts looking at some of the agri specific agricultural issues. We have funded grants who are looking at people who are living in the neighborhood for, you know, the nice word is intensive livestock operations, but the reality is hog farms. Um, you know, we know that there's all kinds of smells, lots of excess pneumonia, um, ammonia. Um, we, we've been able to show that there's um, this some of the um, drug-resistant bacteria that they have in the um, swine are present in the people living around the swine, the areas as well. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing. Um, in the past, if there's an area about an issue with fishing, we might be looking at something like that. Yeah. I should have had have the I should get the number of how many grants we're funding looking at that issue, but we have quite a number that are looking not specifically necessarily at methane. Our focus is health effects. Okay, so we're looking at the health of people who are living near fracking sites, and we have grantees who are studying, looking in some are comparing populations in New York versus Pennsylvania, just on either side of the border, because there's tremendous amount of frac sites in Pennsylvania, and fracking has been banned in New York. And you have um, a lot of the people are in the Geisinger, go to the Geisinger Health Clinic, so that there's a lot of uh, health records that are available, so we're looking at that. Um, I mentioned Colorado. There's some studies being done in other parts of the country where fracking is going on, and we are seeing impacts on a pre increase in premature birth. We're seeing an increase in infants with cardiovascular defects. We're seeing um, increased overall um, hospital visits and so on. So we're looking at this. Not, these are not easy studies to do. You really want to do them longitudinally. Um, we have a program at NIHS, a grants program, where people, they're called time-sensitive grants, where you can write a grant and be funded within 90 days, which for NIH is a record um, that you can get it funded. But that's really important, because if you're in an area where there hasn't been fracking and all of a sudden there's going to be fracking, you want to get baseline data. You want to know the health status of people before fracking stop, starts, not only afterwards. So we are funding some things that have come into us in that area. But I think that we know um, during the fracking process, you know, the chemicals that are used are, there are 760 different chemicals that are used. And in most cases, in North Carolina, it's actually illegal to 
to disclose what those chemicals are, but we do know they include things like benzene and toluene. Benzene is a known human carcinogen and certain other carcinogenic chemicals. Um, during the fracking process, huge amounts of that contaminated fluid is, is forced down in the well, but then something has to happen with where does all that excess water go once the well is drilled? Well, you get this flow back and there are either ponds that they use, huge ponds of this contaminated water, or some places like in Pennsylvania, some of it's just released into nearby rivers. You know, because some people, we used to all think, not, and some people still do, that's the solution to pollution is dilution, but it's not quite that simple. Um, but, but I think, we're beginning to understand that there's a problem during the fracking process. It, it's really an industrial hygiene issue for the people who are doing the fracking because they're using tremendous amounts of silica and too much silica inhalation leads to, leads to lung disease caused silicosis, which basically, you know, is a terrible uh, fibrotic disease of the lung. So that's a huge problem. Um, during that. And, and as well, if you're living in an area, you know, fracking isn't necessarily being done out in the boonies. It is being done in more and more developed areas. You have a huge amount of diesel truck traffic going often on neighborhood roads that really weren't built for them. And the, you have the diesel trucks, so you have the diesel exhaust, but you also have many of them are just um, dump trucks filled with silica. And that's being released, so that's an issue. So I think the biggest concerns that we're addressing right now are during the fracking process. Afterward, you have issues of, say, methane leaks, um, certain amount of radioactivity that can get released um, in the drilling of the wells and afterwards and so on. And I think many of us also know that this is not a sustainable practice because the average well will last at most seven years before it's played out. So in North Dakota, which was probably the first to the fracking fray, um, and among the most active, they're already seeing that many of their wells are no longer producing. Yeah. Several months have revealed that there's just this tremendous gap in sort of perception of risks. Um, and, you know, so much progress has been made by NIEHS over the last four decades, and, I, and it seems like a lot of that could just be for naught if we can't get decision makers and, um, you know, lots of lay people to buy into it. And I'm wondering if you are funding or thinking about funding research on, on risk perception and decision making, like better ways to take all this wonderful information and translate it to people so that they can use it to make more better informed personal decisions and better informed policies. Well, that's a great question. And the answer is sort of. <laughs> um, all of our centers programs, and we have environmental health course centers, children's health centers, super fun centers, I could go on with the different, have to have a community core, which is a community engagement core, because you can't do environmental health research without the community involved. Okay, they have to be involved from the get-go. And many of our community groups are in the community cores, and these are usually associated with academics as well, are developing risk communication and risk strategy. Risk not risk characterization, but risk communication approaches. Because you and I can think that we explain things very clearly, but we might not be talking in the language that people understand. And so we have a lot of work going on in that area. Yeah. Developing a strategic plan, to what extent do short-term, say, political issues drive that process? And when you make funding decisions, do your funding decisions map to your, the, the strategic plan, or do they reflect more short-term issues? That's a great, a great point. First of all, our strategic plan, I think we try to keep politics out of it. Um, so, you know, but every grantee of ours, and we have about a thousand different grants at any one point in time, and all of my intramural scientists can tell you how they're, what they're doing and where it fits into our strategic plan. Um, and that drives much of our funding decisions. Now, for NIH, all of our grants undergo an extensive two-step peer review process where you have the external reviewers and then they're brought to our advisory councils, which are also external groups, for advice. 
but we also take a programmatic look. So, for example, if we're really interested in an issue of health impacts of fracking, and we have two grants that have, say, an equal peer review score, and one is looking at fracking and one is looking at something that we're not that interested in, we might choose the one, for example, with fracking. So we do have an ability to, within the highly, the highly meritorious peer-reviewed grants, to make some decisions on funding in order to address our priorities. Yeah. Media, that there's something called coal rolling or rolling coal. I don't know if you're, you've heard of that before. It seems that in certain parts of this country, people are modifying their diesel trucks so that they're spewing out way more pollutants and like a gray or black cloud. And they, they make a sport of what they're calling hunting hybrid cars. So they will pull in front of the hybrid car, blow out the smoke to obscure their vision. And this is being seen as a sport and something fun to do. And because recently, just before we were talking about um, addressing uh, the community, getting community buy-in and things of that nature, I'm wondering if that is on NIH's horizon. And um, that seems to be something that just started and is spreading across the country. Thank you. Well, as, as I think you know, we're not regulators. We're the researchers who are trying to provide the science that would underpin the regulations. If regulations are enforced, what we need is community groups and community activists to let their decision makers know that they're not happy with that. Burning of coal is going to give you lots of nasty chemicals, and including mercury. Mercury is just one of them. But most mercury or large comes from mining and coal burning around the world. So that may not be a very satisfying answer, but that's reality. We do the science and hopefully we work with people. We work very, um, one of our strategic goals is working with all our stakeholders, which are both community groups, also our industry partners, but also, for example, the media, which is a very powerful voice, and also we do work with our congressional liaisons and stuff. Okay. Well, I think we're ready for 